What's up, everybody? It's Alex from Heavy New York, and on the phone we got Dan Sugarman from Ice Nine Kills. Thank you for your time today, man. I appreciate it. What's up? What's up, Alex? Thanks so much for having me, man. I'm stoked to be here. Yeah, it's so awesome to have you here. Another good old quarantine exclusive, as I call it. <laughs> quarantine. Quarantine. Yeah. Ooh, you you need to you need to trademark that name right now. I'm pretty sure everyone who else. All, all the people who are quarantined right now have come up with that shit, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, it's a definitely a time for creativity. Absolutely, man. Yeah. <laughs> but you have your solo album, Inside Out Part 1, um, coming out soon. What I'm curious is, what was, like, the thought process going into it, being that this is a solo album? Like, did you, like, have a preconceived idea, or was there kind of, like, a lot of improvising involved? Um... Ironically, it's it's both of those things combined. Uh, this album is my second instrumental album, and it was born out of some pretty uh, dark shit in my life. Basically, my mom had been suffering from brain cancer for about ten years. I'm very sorry. Um, and she, yeah, she she was going through like all that heavy stuff while I was on tour with my old band as Blood Runs Black. And around 2016 or so, it got so bad that I decided to leave as Blood Runs Black to stay at home to be my mother's caregiver and help take care of her. And I kind of like swore off touring and music altogether because I felt like family was way more important and I had just wasted eight years being on the, on the road with this Blood Runs Black and not being at home with her when she was healthy enough, you know? And now I'm, I'm stuck at home taking care of her as she's like paralyzed in a bed and unable to speak. So it became this thing where like, I had to use um, the music as an outlet for myself. So the process came about from a mixture of like needing to do this as like a journaling thing. So I, I kind of sat down and preconceived this idea. Like I wanted to do um, a release once per month and I wanted to have a different collaborator on each song. And I wanted each of those songs to kind of be like a journaling process of me going through, coming to an understanding with all this stuff, kind of knowing that I was watching my mom on her last few breaths. Um, and so the, the album was set about in the sense that I gave myself parameters to work within. Like I wanted to work with, you know, this guy and this guy. I wanted to have a song that had like a, a lighter vibe. I wanted to have songs that were like heavy and technical. So I gave myself those parameters. But the second I sat down to record, it was all improvised. Mm -hmm. That was like the biggest thing for me when it comes to songwriting is literally just that. It's give yourself a few parameters, some creative parameters to work within and then do your job to be the best conduit to channel that information that's coming through you. Because I'm, I'm weird and I don't believe that anything musically or creatively for that matter um, is something that of the person who made it owns. I think they were just like there to bring it to life. You're kind of like a midwife, so to speak. Um, so for me, I just made it my job to like be a pure channel to like say the shit that I didn't have words for because there was so much going on in my life at the time that like this is the only way that I managed to move forward and not lose myself in it. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of artists have used pain as a paintbrush before as a way to triumph over turmoil and tragedy. And I give yeah. you a lot of credit for being able to express this pain through music. You know, obviously, you know, if I were to talk to a vocalist, obviously this turmoil would influence lyricism. But for you, could your experience also determine the music in itself in a way? Even though you said that there was improvising when you went down to record, I'd imagine that what you went through influenced what we're hearing as well, right? Oh, absolutely. T to me, the improvising is the most unfiltered, unadulterated form of like a, uh, a, a, pure, a pure message of what I was trying to say. So like, if I was to sit there for instance, like right now, this this interview is so unscripted. Imagine if we would have done this through an inter or an email, and I would be able to sit there and perfect everything. Like it's not as real and personable. So when I sit down to write a song with a few parameters, knowing that I'm going to improvise and make the stuff in the moment, whatever the moment is asking for, it allows for like a little bit of the human touch element to kind of come in. And I think that human element actually provides a stronger emotional backbone for the listener to kind of relate to. Mm -hmm. I think metal is, is, is so far removed from that that it becomes a little bit stale and stagnant. And a lot of my album is like searing, you know, exacto knife accuracy. But then on the same exact time, I have all this human touch going on. There's like, I don't want to use the word errors, but it's like happy accidents all over the record. Because as I was saying, I improvise. So things just happen. Mm -hmm. And if, if like, for instance, I just said if twice in that sentence. 
one could say I stuttered, one could say I was in the middle of getting my thought out. So, like, when that happens in an improv setting, I think there's a reason it happened. It doesn't need to be edited out and removed. Do you know what I mean? Definitely. And, you know, being, I feel like with this album, you know, like, listening to it, like, it really does capture a moment. Like, I, I love asking artists this, but, like, you know, sometimes you're working on a song, just one song for days or weeks or even months, and I feel like that moment or that spark could sort of fade away. But being that this is improvised, it almost has to capture that moment and to an extent, right? There's, like, no in-between. Yeah, it's, it's I, I literally create my, my personal music as, like, a time capsule. That's how I work. I'm, I'm trying to literally encapsulate a moment in time, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, by by being the unfiltered conduit in the moment and by not like imposing my desires or needs on the song. Like a lot of times I might be working on something technically that I really want to put into a song and instead of forcing a square into a circle hole, I sit there and I go like, what is the song asking for? And instead of imposing my will, I'm there to serve the song. And I think that, that headspace as a, as a writer, I think is one of the most liberating things that I've come to. Because it just allows me to just be there to do the work instead of, like, force the work to happen. Do you know what I mean? Definitely. And, you know, obviously I can't speak for her, but, like, you know, I, I think your mom would be very, very proud and thankful for what you're doing and that you are expressing your emotion and what you went through with to the people through an art that is very, very signature. I give you all the credit in the world for that. Thank you, man. Yeah, my, my mom absolutely would be uh, very, very happy with what I've done with this. A lot of... You know, the darkness that came along with it has been, um, the word alchemy comes to mind. Do you know, do you know the word alchemy? Yeah. Yeah, like a lot, a lot of this to me is just many different forms of alchemy. It was like, how can I take a shitty pitch black situation and turn it into something positive and meaningful and hopeful for others? And like, that's, that's really where I put my head when I'm trying to make music is really like, that's, that's really all it's about, is finding ways to make the music into some type of medicine for someone. I've always felt like the, the purest forms of music are oftentimes like me putting myself so much into my music that when the listener hears it on their end, it's like more of a mirror that reflects themselves into it. So hopefully they could like understand things about themselves or like realize that they're not alone in something. And it really, in my opinion, like the more unfiltered and raw music is, I think the more that that is the effect on the other side. Definitely. And that's something that I live for. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes the clouds block the sun, but the clouds will never be there forever. So Exactly. Exactly. Yep. When there's this there's this beautiful quote that you just made me think of. It's, uh, if I face the sun, the shadows fall behind me. Yep. And my yeah. favorite my favorite quote is, there's no such thing as the bottom. It's just the point where you decide to stop digging. That's fucking huge, man. Yeah, yes. That was from uh, my best friend in college. Um, I love her. Yeah. Now, b this album also incorporates uh, some guest spots such as Alex Campbell and Angel Vivaldi. What I was curious is, did you express what this record was about and what the meaning of it was before they laid it down? Or did you have like your recordings already made and then you sent it to them and then they kind of added their own little spin on it? Well, each of the collaborations that happened with this record all happened uniquely and a little bit differently. So the... All of the different collaborations were, were kind of unique. Um, the Angel thing happened because he and I connected from my previous album, Center Sun. We randomly met at NAMM several years ago. Wow, that's actually ironic. All of our musical connections happened through NAMM. Um, we, we met at NAMM, and I was actually invited to do uh, a music video with him called Crystal Planet. It was a Joe Satriani cover. Yeah. I think it has like 3 million views at this point. It's insane, but I was introduced to him by Lee McKinney, the guitar player of Born of Osiris. And uh, I come to find out that day that Lee was introducing me to him because Lee couldn't do that music video. And Lee introduced me to Angel because he thought I would be a good replacement for him. And that turned out to be the most powerful thing that ever could have happened because in that relationship came uh, a lot of musical children, so to speak. We, uh, we did Crystal Planet, and then I immediately invited them to do a guest solo on my song Cosmosis, the closing track on my first record, Center Sun. And then um, the following year at NAMM, this is when Inside Out was being written. And I'm trying to remember the timeline of it specifically, but I think he had come over, and he was going to sleep at my house because I lived very close to uh, the airport. He was going to sleep at my house and then leave the next morning, and his flight got canceled. So he wound up staying at my house for a week, 
and we were just like dude let's just let's just write a song so that song particularly was completely born out of he and i sitting in a room together riffing passing ideas back and forth um and he was absolutely extremely aware of the situation we were writing this record in my mom's old bedroom my my studio became my mom's room where her nurse could take care of her that's it's it's a very weird like six degrees of what the fuck basically my old studio my mom the bed that my mom stayed in where she passed away was exactly in the place where i channeled and wrote my first album center son and then i wrote inside out in the exact place where her bed was in her bedroom so like we had swatched, switched places and it was just like a very weird energetic kind of connection on that end but angel knew my mom loved my mom knew she was downstairs on the other side of the wall as we were writing this song and it was um completely done to feel good we wanted to make a song that feels good and if i'm honest it's the only song that has a positive vibe in it mm-hmm. uh, and then there's other songs like creatures of circumstance for instance which was written and recorded like a week or so before I was moving from my old house. And we were, me and Alex were on the balcony just talking about our childhood. And he, he had gone through a lot of abuse in his life. I had gone through, um, my, my mom had been you know sick with brain cancer for many years. My dad had heart attacks several times from the time I was like a young kid. So like we were just talking about how like, what happens with our parents and how we're like raised really affects us as individuals as we grow up. And that's where the term creatures of circumstance came from. I was literally like, I think I just said like, Oh yeah, man, we're all creatures of circumstance. Holy shit. There's our title. And then we immediately walked inside after having this discussion to compose the melodies for this song. So like that was born from a very dark discussion as opposed to a situation that was forced that we used to make happy things. That was with angel. And then um, the other collaborations were all very, like, each of these have their own unique stories. Track four, Mind Frame. Um, I worked with a child prodigy guitar player named Sims Cashian. He, at the time, I think he was 16 when we did this. Dude is unbelievably talented and, like, far beyond his years as a player and a person in general. And this was far more of a, let me send you this song so you can record your ideas over it. So that's how that one happened. And then Nova, track five, was done with Ruben Alvarez from Upon a Burning Body. And that one happened again super spontaneously. He he hit me up, was like, hey, dude, I'm staying in L.A. uh, here to record a music video for Upon a Burning Body's new record, uh, which was ironic because Upon a Burning Body and my old band Fallen Figure went out on our first tours ever together, like a decade prior to this. Wow. So the fact that he was randomly in town, randomly a few blocks away from my house, was like, dude, you've got to come over. Let's write a song. So we wrote this song. Um, Danny from Upon a Burning Body, the vocalist, came over to watch us do it. Tito, the drummer, was there hanging with us. And we just made this song in a couple days between, um, you know, sh- shooting time that they were on set. So it was like, that was a very, very fun one. And the messed up part inside of this is this was in the weeks leading up to my mom passing away. Ruben and I go back like over a decade. His dad passed away um soon after our first tour together and he was their driver so i was pretty pretty close with his father as well and knowing that his dad recently passed away and ruben happened to show up at my house as my mom was passing away to write songs about the situation all felt very uh like like fate was kind of pressing this to happen Mm -hmm. and um yeah man and then the, the last song sort of occurred completely spontaneously uh this track five was done my mom was there's something that i learned as my mom was dying uh it's called cosmo breathing i guess it's like when you're literally having your last breaths you take like these huge deep breaths you hold your breath you exhale your breath doesn't come back and i was literally like watching my mom go through days of cosmo breathing and it fucked me up so bad that I literally needed to revert into my studio, lock the door, and begin working on a song. And uh, the way that this song kind of came about was so freaking naturally. I actually, in talking about it over the past few days with people, I'm realizing subconsciously where all the pieces came from. Um, The chord progression in the song is something that I pulled on. It was the very first song I ever wrote in my house. 
with my very first band ever. It was literally just a chord progression that I had no idea that I was pulling on. So that happened from when I was like, you know, probably 14 years ago. It's a chord progression from then. And then I actually accidentally pulled on the beginning of Come As You Are by Nirvana, which was the first song I ever learned on guitar, which my mom got me my first guitar and brought me to that first guitar lesson. So I got to infuse like a moment of Come As You Are in this. My mom and I watched X-Files every night before she went to sleep. So I actually put the X-Files theme inside of this song. And I'm, mi- I'm missing like six other different components that were like accidental Easter eggs yeah. that I put inside of this song that are just like so... The weirdest part is it was all accidental. And I think that's what's really, really interesting about the idea of being a conduit to music. Yeah. And knowing that like you're, you're literally just channeling some shit. I'm not in control of yeah. any of the stuff that I had to say and it sort of just happened. Yeah. Well, it goes to show that it's real. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, man. Yeah. yeah, sorry to interrupt. Do we have a time limit? Just because I have like four more questions. I wasn't sure if there... Oh, dude, you're, you're good, man. I'm, I'm, I'm loose today. Right. I'm, I'm enjoying this. So let's, let's have some fun. All right, awesome. Cool. Now, when it comes to all the projects that you've been involved with, playing with Ice Nine Kills now, your solo stuff, and your time with As Blood Runs Black, like, is there almost kind of like a different mind frame depending on the projects that you're on, or is there kind of like a usual go-to method behind the madness that applies to everything? It's a really interesting question. Um, I tend to think of joining a band as like a collective consciousness. Like when I joined As Blood Runs Black, I needed to throw away the way that I write alone. I needed to throw away the way that I would write for my band, Fallen Figure at the time. And I needed to step into this this collective consciousness of As Blood Runs Black, right? Which is going to be different types of riffing, different types of rhythms, different types of song structures, different types of buildups and shit like that. So like, it's really a matter of being super observant and self-aware and kind of understanding the rules that that are needing to be filled and where you kind of fit in. So with As Blood Runs Black, for instance, I knew immediately that I needed to be the main songwriter because I was replacing the old main songwriter, the old uh, lead guitar player. So I needed to step up and, and make that happen. So it was my job to write an insane amount of songs for any of those records. Like I remember for the last record we did, Ground Zero, I wrote like probably 30 to 40 plus songs. Wow. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. And it was purely on the notion of like, I'm a firm believer that every, it really, it comes from this. So I, I have a practice called Xingyi that I've been learning for many years. It's an internal martial art practice that my uncle teaches. Um, but the idea is that every breath you take is a chance to do it better than the last one. Right. So it really, for me, every single chance that I have, every opportunity that I have to write a song, it's going to be better than the last one. And I don't look at it like a job, like, shit, i got to write another song. It's an opportunity to do it better than the last one. So, like, me writing 40 songs for Ground Zero and getting um, eight out of the ten tracks of the things that I wrote on the record is a positive to me. It doesn't feel like a loss because the ones that didn't make it um, were catalysts. They were They were bricks in the road you know what i mean aren't you ever worried though that maybe there'll be a b-side one day it'll just be the biggest hit you ever wrote Ah, the the irony inside of that is the only songs that ever do well are always the songs that i think won't do well (laughs) like it happens every freaking time whenever there's like ah this one is lame like this is good just get this one out that's always the one people gravitate towards it's always the the viral hit um (laughs) doesn't that the worst it's the worst it's the worst so yeah I, I could say I'd be worried about that but if I let myself really think about it then I would just give up dude <laughs> yeah when it comes to your guitar playing do you actually have a theoretical background like you know what scale you're working off of and mode and all that or do you or do you improvise and you're more self-taught um no I'm, I'm weirdly very uh on both paths I use my theory I'm, I'm like a fairly trained musician i i like schooled myself on all this shit i did you know theory classes and all that stuff um but my improv brain is throw shit at a wall and see what sticks because i've done the work to understand how you know what letters you put together to make a word and then what words you put together to make a sentence what sentences you put together to make a paragraph what paragraph you put together to make a story like it all it's all so in line with speaking that to me it's just a matter of of again just being there to 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 watch the work happen like i'm not there doing the work it sort of just 
occurs, as weird as that sounds. I've not said it several times, but like, yeah, man, it's 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 just this thing that possesses you and takes over. Yeah, of course. And now when you join a project, like, you know, you joined Ice Nine Kills in 2019, like, were you, like, looking at, you know, the Silver Scream and every trick in the book and being like, okay, this is how I have to play? Or did Spencer kind of want you to bring a little bit of your own mix to the live presence of Ice Nine? I was, uh, I was really lucky in the sense that Spencer reached out to me specifically for my, like, my playing abilities, my writing abilities, and my performance abilities. Um, so, like, uh, immediately I was given the free reign to play whatever the fuck you want for the solos, dude. Make them you. Right away, I was, like, I improvise probably half the solos I do every night. Um, and then I was immediately given the opportunity to start writing for Final Cut. I wrote your numbers up. I did Thriller with them. I did all the acoustic arrangements for the acoustic songs that came out with that. Um, you know, and then also being able to to be asked to like actually be a part of the performance because a lot of the the older members um were a lot more standstill and i think it worked very well but we wanted to have like a whole overhaul of how we perform and we are now so over the top energetic on every single aspect yeah. that there's not there's not a single moment where you don't have something to watch and be entertained by yeah you know when, what I mean? when i saw that webster hall show i was just insane and there was three other big metal shows happening that night as well and I think you were the only one to sell out, so... Yeah, yeah, dude. Like, there's there's something to be said about, like, the audience, too, gravitating towards that. Like, there's... It's almost unfair to call Ice Nine Kills a band. It's like a... It's, it's like an event more so than a band. It's, it's like a, a Broadway play and a show together. Yeah, definitely. And that's that was insane. Like, and I'd imagine, because, like, all the other members... Of Ice Nine Kills, like I know that uh, Ricky was in This or the Apocalypse. I know that Patrick was in Affiance, and I, like I'd imagine that all of your previous projects have to somewhat influence like the live presence of Ice Nine, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Ricky Ricky comes from a background of being the vocalist, so like he's been given like the ability to, and he's also a great guitar player. So now he's up, up on stage doing his insane vocals and playing guitar, and now you know, having fun going nuts with a guitar in his hands instead of a microphone. So for him, it's like a whole new world of shit to discover and have fun with. And then Patrick is like probably one of the best performing drummers I have ever seen and had the privilege to play with. Like that dude, I, he, we all are pretty certain that Patrick actually had coronavirus um, on our last headliner tour probably like three, four months ago. Oh, really? Um, yeah, because like there's all this information coming out now that it was in America way prior to what was said, and all of his symptoms had to do with that. And he was told that he had like strep throat and like three other things because they just didn't know what the hell it was. But Patrick would literally he'd be in his bunk sleeping, uh, recovering until like right before we had to go on stage. He'd be like shivering and shaking and would get behind his drum kit, play an amazing fucking show. And then you'd literally see him curled in a ball on the floor shaking after the show. That's... Because he couldn't, like, like that is the type, hour and a half performance. Oh. You know what I mean? Wow. Like, the dude is a freaking beast, and seeing him do that every night on that tour made me have so much more respect for him. Even, like, that's, that's saying that I didn't have respect for him, but, like, if there could be any more than I already had, I, I doubled it at least. Like, that blew my freaking mind. Well... And then Joe... Joe, on the other hand, comes from this background of being the most insane piano performer in his old band, the Venetia Fair. They were like over the top carnival pop rock, weird instrumental shit. And he's now on bass and singing. And dude's got the voice of a freaking angel and plays bass like Flea. And it's just unreal to watch him put these pieces together in a different way. So, like, like everyone comes from having the confidence in what they do but we're all doing it kind of differently you know like yeah. even I'm doing much more vocals than I've ever did in As Blood Runs Black with Ice Nine so that's a new fun thing for me to do so like all of us have way more on our plates and we're all having way more fun with it than I think we ever did and I think there's something to be said about that and I think it's definitely tangible to those who watch us play live yeah when it comes to playing live this could go for any project is there almost a similar energy into playing live as it is when you're songwriting like is there maybe a similar creative aspect behind it or is it a completely separate art that you have to practice oh that's a very cool question um my mind initially goes to 
I've, I've actually said this so many freaking times. Remember when I said, like, it's about just being in the place to let the work happen through you and channeling it and yada yada? I, I truly feel like that the thing that I'm talking about could argue, arguably just be called the zone, right? Um, that place that you go to is exactly where you go when you step on stage. Time disappears, people disappear, um, hunger disappears, knowing or needing to go to the bathroom disappears, like human functions disappear and your whole entire body and being is there to do the single task, whether it be perform and entertain 3,000 people or finish this song inside of my room alone. It's like the same headspace of being like a servant to the moment is really what I think it is. And you, you allow yourself to be possessed by whatever it is. And I think that's truly what like a solid musician allows is just like that possession to be full fledged. Yeah. I'd imagine, especially with the intensity of the Ice Nine Kill shows, you almost have to like rehearse the choreography as much as you have to rehearse the songs, right? There is a lot to be said about that, man. Um, we take our performance very, very seriously. Um, our last headliner, we have like an unbelievable uh, set on stage. Like we had ridiculous lights. We had worlds, one of a kind in the world fog machine that created this really thick floor fog. We had um, geysers. We had confetti blowers. Like we had all this crazy shit. And you have to know where not to be and where to be at specific moments in songs. And we we take rehearsal very seriously. We do tour rehearsals. Uh, I think on that tour we had like three or four days where we did like 15 hour days of just going through the set, knowing where everyone was supposed to be, make sure no one's going to get injured. I mean, like, Spencer walks around on stage with a metal knife. Like, it's dull, but it's still a f fucking metal knife. Like, and he's fake stabbing and fake slicing throats of a Chevy or a makeup artist. Mm. Um, Do you have any trouble getting into the venue with that? <laughs> Dude, <laughs> if you have any idea how many fake weapons that we travel internationally and nationally with it's insane like one of the most ridiculous realizations and moments i had about being like I, I now know i'm in the weirdest band ever because backstage you'll hear spencer screaming where's my knife <laughs> where's where's the fake blood like the fact that these are quotes that come out of anyone's mouth uh makes me just die of laughter dude it's it's hilarious but we've, we've had We've had no ser quote unquote serious issues. Like we do have, you know, venue staff question it, and we'll be like, "No, it's dull." We'll show them it's a dull night. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like it, it all comes in in a road case, and hopefully they don't walk backstage and see it. That's that's typically how we get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's uh, that's. I really wish I I interviewed Spencer two years ago uh, at the St. Vitus gig, and. Uh, and, uh, like, I remember, like, seeing all this stuff around. I'm like, well, as if the basement at St. Vitus wasn't sketchy enough. Like, so. Dude, I mean, we, when we have the backstage, like, costume area, um, we have a table that has, like, a black curtain that goes on it. And then it just has, like, knives and axes and all the different weapons laid out every night before we go on. The most funny shit ever. Like, the fact that those are my stage tools now just is so humorous to me as if <laughs> as if carrying your guitar rig wasn't enough <laughs> yeah yeah oh shit i forgot the knives yeah exactly <laughs> um i have two more questions for you you ready for the most difficult question of the whole interview kind of going back to your solo stuff let's do it how do you know when a song is done Ooh, this is going to harken back to one of my favorite quotes that i ever heard about songwriting um i'm pretty sure you and probably a lot of your listeners have heard of herbie hancock pianist yeah. yep yeah he's an incredible jazz pianist uh he has said this one thing that stuck with me forever you know a song is complete when you can't take anything else away yep. so uh herbie hancock said that you know a song is complete when you can't take anything else out of it and that perspective blew my mind because it's coming from like this minimalist standpoint when you're sitting and writing a song you know it starts with like a riff or a drum beat and then you add some more shit you're like all right let me add guitar right, let me add the lead on top of it, let me add some texture and some ambience, and all of a sudden you have like seven different things doing seven, seven different layers at once, right? That perspective, or that, that approach to making music is something that everyone does. And then to have a secondary filter come in after, 
that says, what can I take away? What can I remove to make this better? Like that is so interesting to me and it's created such powerful dynamics in my songwriting since I started implementing that, that it's become one of my like final questions before I feel like I can release a song. The other one actually that's a newer one that I've been using a lot is what distracts me. Literally as I'm listening to a song that I'm deeming again, quote unquote complete, I sit back out of my studio chair, I'll sit in the couch behind it, because if I'm in the studio chair, I'll hit space bar and edit something. But I literally sit down as like a listener um, in several different filters. I'll listen to it as like asshole elitist listener who's looking for all the problems. And then I'll listen to it as like the drunk guy on top of the balcony spilling beer on everybody. You yeah. know what I mean? So like with those two perspectives, like I'm drunk guy, can I, is my head wanting to move all the time? Does it make me want to like pace back and forth in my room? Is there energy? Do I start to get bored? Like, those, those are things that drunk asshole balcony guy is going to look for. And then super elitist guy up front staring at the fretboard, watching to make sure that the guitar player doesn't mess up. That's me listening for, like, are all the parts clean? Is everything, um, does everything flow well? And then I listen to it as a producer and songwriter where it's like, does anything distract me? Is anything volume-wise off? Um, is that layer taking away from the main melody? So it's really like making sure that the focal point isn't convoluted with anything cushioning it too much. Yeah. Right. So it's it's what what can I take away and what's distracting me and be the uh, barricade asshole and the balcony asshole. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, can I just say something? And I, I've I've said this a few times, but I could officially say it now and mean it. That was probably the best answer for the, that question I've ever gotten from any artist I've interviewed. That's awesome, dude. Yeah. Uh, most people like just take the easy way out and just say, oh, when I get the final mix back and the label approves it. Oh, dude. <laughs> Screw that, man. Like, <laughs> I, I spend the majority of my time is, you know, besides writing my own music and working with Ice Nine and touring, I'm a guitar teacher. So, like, all of my time is spent explaining stuff in depth, going super deep, making sure that the language that I'm using is the language that you use for learning. Like, there's a lot of different pieces that go inside of that. So for me, that type of question is incredibly awesome and one that I've answered a hundred times, believe it or not. Yeah. And uh, finally, I just wanted to ask you, you know, the new solo uh, album, like, because you, you released um, this, this single, Nova, um, could this almost serve as, like, a clear, like, in a way, like, representation of what the whole solo album is going to sound like, or is this just scratching the surface? I would say that Nova is just scratching the surface. That song has, like, a... It's a dark, uplifting kind of vibe. It grooves hard as shit. It's very dark, uh, but it's not as fast and technical as a lot of the other songs on the record. And it's also a lot less emotional than a lot of songs on the record because, again, this song was designed to kind of have fun with Ruben. Like, and Ruben from A Pomegranate Body. So he comes from this like flamenco background uh so we and hip-hop so we wanted to infuse like you, you heard the song there's a, there's sections where we use nylon guitars we have some hip-hop samples in there we both grew up loving like Limp biscuit and all that shit and mashuga so we wanted to infuse some throwback new metal with some new kind of new metal influences and then we both love opeth and death metal so we basically threw, like, these are the parameters that I was talking about at the beginning. Like, we threw in all these interesting things we wanted to infuse, but we gave ourselves the free reign to create it however we wanted, right? Like, we literally, I probably could find somewhere the piece of paper where we wrote all of these ideas down that we wanted to include, and I'm sure we didn't have a check next to all of them, but being able to include any of them is what made this song such a, like, to me, this is a party song. It's a fun jam song. It grooves, you know, it makes you want to move. Um, the other ones are cerebral and make you think and feel. So I would say this is scratching the surface, but it is a pretty solid appetizer to get you to understand the way that I put my songs together. For you, sure. you seem like a mad scientist behind the guitar. Some guitar players, they find their style and they kind of just want to stick with that, which, I, which is fine. I don't judge guitar players for that, but it almost seems like experimentation is just key for you. Oh, dude, I am such a nerd, man. Like, my, I don't even call my studio a studio. I call it the laboratory. Like, that should, that should prove, you, prove to you how, how clearly mad scientist and nerdy I am about my shit. I um, absolutely am here to discover new 
new ways to combine things that I haven't done before. Like one of my favorite things is this idea of one plus one equals three. Have you heard of that before? Yeah. It's the idea of like, you know, your mom plus your dad equals you. Like two, two people together creates a third thing. Yeah. So you could take that notion and be like, all right, I want to infuse hip hop. I want to infuse flamenco and I want to infuse metal. And then all of a sudden we have Nova. You know what I mean? So it's coming up with interesting ways to combine things that haven't been done before. Because what you're going to find is that you have this fresh plus familiar kind of equation. Like if it's new, but like for some reason I kind of know what's going on. It's like nostalgic for some reason, but I've never heard this. Like when you can find that fine line between that, I think that people latch on to it really, really quickly. And they find that there's a unique feeling in it that they couldn't find somewhere else. Definitely. Because one plus one equals three. Awesome. So uh, before we go, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Really enjoyed this discussion. Um, just I know there's definitely a lot of stuff to promote. Obviously, you know, touring is not in the books right now. I was actually supposed to see you guys at uh, Epicenter and uh, welcome to Rockville in Florida. Damn. Yeah. Um, so is there just any way that fans could support you guys in Ice Nine with merch, like where people could find that? Obviously, the new solo album. And I know that you're doing some lessons. You just want to plug that as well. Anything you want to plug? Yeah, absolutely, dude. Um, well, as everyone knows, Ice Nine Kills is forever releasing the most ridiculous merch every night. NightmareOnTheNinth.com. I also believe we have INK-Merch.com where you can get all of our stuff. Um, we've recently done some very, very, very helpful releases where we were we were raising funds to actually pay out our displaced crew uh, because all these tours got canceled. We have people who rely on what we do as their means of income. So we actually use the sales from these shirts to pay out our crew, which was something that I am so happy that we could do that with music. Cause like crew members are the, the you know, that makes all the shit happen, man. That's, the, that's how the clock turns. They're the fifth, so sixth, them, seventh, without, eighth, ninth beetle. Yeah, man. Without, without them, we're, we're literally nothing and unable to do, do. So that was really cool. Um, and then, you know, <laughs> Ice Nine just yesterday released uh, Stacy's mom cover that we called Jason's mom. Uh, <laughs> it's a Friday the Thirteenth themed Stacy's mom cover for Mother's Day, which is really freaking hilarious on all aspects, and it's actually been received much better than any of us anticipated. Which is harkens right back to what I said before. Whenever you think it's not going to do well, it always does well. Um, yeah, I'm not going to lie. I was dying when I heard that. So, dude, it's so it's just fun. Like, that's all it is, and I love that. Yeah, and I think this is a good way to, you know, contribute to the loss of Adam as well from Fountains yeah, of Wayne. Yeah, man. So. We, we somehow managed to tie in, you know, the dedication to Adam. We managed to tie in the 40th anniversary to Friday the 13th and Mother's Day. I don't know how we hit those marks, but we did. <laughs> but um, Go it, was, it was insane. But then, like, other, other than that, uh, I have all of my pre-order merch for my album as well as future merch. I'm sure this will come out shortly after the pre-orders are done but I will have new designs available everything is on sugarmanshop.com uh, I have hoodies, merch, or, or t-shirts posters, pick tins signed and unsigned CDs, digital CDs for my new album, old albums um, tap books the whole nine and um, it's it's been incredible I've been absolutely blown away with the support that's been pouring in people are so much more into this instrumental shit right now than I actually anticipated, so it's really, really cool to see that. And the the side effect of people being into instrumental music is their ears and eyes open up to guitar playing. So the amount of interest in guitar lessons over the years has also gone up tremendously. So I've been giving private guitar lessons on Skype, which is basically a social distancing style lesson. For the past 10 years I've been doing that, and it's been really really incredible I, I teach for probably about five to six hours a day yeah you, you um, were social distancing before it was cool exactly dude i in all honesty i've quarantined myself since i became a musician i live in my freaking studio <laughs> yeah but i have you know i do uh private lessons dansugarman.com backslash lessons you can go and check out prices for that i also have this incredibly new guitar lesson community that i just launched and created that i'm calling sugarman's lesson lounge it's effectively a giant community. I have close to 200 of my students on there currently where I'm dropping free lesson content almost daily. You're getting my support and like direct help and advice and insight 
as often as you need it. You have the support of all of my other 200 students, and there is an endless array of resources and topics to discuss and read about and many lessons to go through. Um, there's many courses that I have available already, and all of that is free. Uh, you can sign up for that at dansugarman.com backslash lesson lounge, and that's, that's going to be something that I'm going to focus very heavily on in the coming weeks or months, I'm going to be launching the next phase of that, which will be Masterclass live stream courses. So if anyone is interested in that, I have been teaching guitar for over a decade. Um, it's something that I do and take very, very seriously. The way that I teach is very customized. I design everything that I do for your personal needs. And even though it's going to be over like a large community, I actually have designed several ways to hit those marks. We're going to have questionnaires to where I can tailor all of the different types of topics to where you are as a player. So I'm very excited about that. It's been going really, really well. And I feel like if I keep plugging any more of my businesses, it's going to be annoying. But there's <laughs> plenty of other things, man. Like I have a vegan clothing company that I'm launching with Joe, Iceman Kills bass player, called Anti-Cruelty Cult. Um, that will be happening soon. There's going to be like a cookbook and a cook show, cooking show with, along with that. Like we're quarantine man it's it's causing so much free time and yeah. so much ideas you, so we're just running with it yeah i i'm excited like man just thank you for staying creative and you know and uh feeding uh, all the content hungry people that are out there right now thank you absolutely man yeah but, I, I appreciate i appreciate you and i appreciate what you do uh providing the ability to have people who are hungry for information and insight and advice and just getting into the brains of the artists that they like are into that's one of the most powerful things ever. And in, in reality, that actually gives me a reminder of something else that I'm doing. Totally forgot about this. I'm launching a podcast soon called Mindframe, uh, based on track four on my record titled Mindframe. Yep. Um, where I'm going to be interviewing artists that you know you guys know and love, and I'm going to be designing it in a way where I ask everyone similar questions in order to get into their minds. Because I'm finding ways that if you ask the right question you get answers back that give you applicable and actionable insight that you could apply to your own life. So the things that I want to discuss are going to be things like when you felt like nothing was working for you, how did you find the energy to keep going? Or like what struggles have you had in your life that turns you into who you are? You know what I mean? Like if you can have 100 artists ask the same 10 questions and get different responses from everybody, that's what I'm looking for. So I'm going to be putting together a podcast and a book on that end and that's going to be something that I'm very very excited about getting out to everybody because the amount of times that I myself have gone on those hunts for those answers and not found them uh, gives me an energy and a, a readiness for this that I didn't even know that I had so I'm, I'm going balls out on that one too awesome awesome looking forward to hearing it all but Dan thank you so much everybody Dan Sugarman be sure to pick up Inside Out Part 1 it is absolutely awesome this is Alex from Heavy New York we will see you next time